Welcome back, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I am headed to the airport for a red eye into New Jersey. I got a fun weekend ahead. I got my mom's 70th birthday party. I got a friend from college's wedding. And then I got Passover on Monday with family that I haven't seen in too long. So I'm from New Jersey. I'm in San Diego now. I moved here 10 years ago for work and all is good. So I'm going to keep the intro pretty short, but I did want to let you know that I just had a really... <laughs> It's so cliche to say that I just had a great conversation, but I did. I'm sorry. With a guy named John Morris. Who is he? What is he doing? He's running for Congress out of Maryland's third district. Okay. He wants to be in the House of Representatives. He's a progressive. He's in the in the mold of Bernie Sanders. So I have to admit that he was very persuasive. And at the moment, I'm like, gun to my head. Okay, I'm a progressive deep down. I didn't want to fight it, but I am a progressive. And the progressives just need to and my function is going to be to fix the progressives messaging and rough smooth out some of the edges but ultimately yes i'm a progressive i don't know how long that feeling will last but that's how persuasive he was so i'm excited to introduce that episode for you to you thank you for following my search for political identity if you want to do me a huge favor like this wherever you're listening comment on it share it with friends and that's all i've got to say guys i gotta go catch a plane See you later. John, welcome to the program, sir. Thanks for having me, Brian. My pleasure. I like how you have a, an easy to pronounce name. I appreciate <laughs> that. No real questions. Great to have you. Did you listen to any of the Joe Rogan podcast today? I did not. I don't listen to him, really. I see clips from time to time. Do you? I'm kind of curious. Do you? Uh, no, I, I have actually never listened to him. I mean, I know of him. Um, but right. I haven't. Yeah. The reason I bring it up is because he had Tucker Carlson on. It's just kind of a fun way to start the conversation, I think. Two interesting characters, okay? Uh, I'm not saying that we should be focusing on them for the rest of our conversation, but two popular guys who, if you're online a lot like I am, probably to a failing, you'll see them mentioned. And they had a conversation today and they were talking about UAPs. And just, it's just my, my point of bringing this up. I don't know if you've heard Tucker's comments that have gone viral, but, oh, it's so dark that I don't tell my wife about it. It's so bizarre, right? This this world online, could it be true? Could there be something crazy going on? I don't know. The reason I start this way, John, is because I'm finding it difficult to figure out what's real, what's true, what's accurate, and what I believe. So I'm in that process of figuring, reassessing all my political beliefs hmm. and, uh, I got online to three years ago to spread the word about this podcast, when, which I started in law school after during studying critical race theory, a whole 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 lot going on at that time. And I started it and I got on social media. I'd never been on social media because I was kind of a recluse in my young adult life. I just kind of didn't have the confidence or interest to be doing anything public facing and didn't even have social media. Got on X to uh promote this podcast called searching for political identity and all of a sudden i get introduced to the whole alien uap phenomenon and now it's really captivated my interest so i just bring that up to say it's a search for truth and what's right in a world where it become it seems harder and harder to find that do you agree with that or am i just being lazy and caught in the wrong corners of x well i mean i i mean i i see what you're saying i mean i think for me um, you know, speaking from the political perspective, at least, because I, you know, I'm running for Congress, and I, you know, I have a very strong sense of justice and truth for what I believe in, um, and I believe that's uh, the things that that I stand for help people the most, and that's what we're trying to do when we go to Congress. Um, I think you're getting a little philosophical here on me, and uh, um, I'm fascinated with space, though, um, and you know, I think that there's there's so much we don't know, uh, right? And I know that this has really piqued uh, the, the public's interest. Right. So you're running for Congress. It's pretty serious, right? I mean, that's a, that takes courage. It takes guts. Uh, I admire you for it. How Thanks. do you know you're ready to run for Congress? We can get into your background and your career. Perhaps it's the confidence from your law practice. Is that what it was mostly? How do you become confident in yourself to say, I'm ready to, I know what I believe and I'm ready to do this process. How do you know that? Well, Brian, I don't think that was really the question I was asking myself. I was really seeing a problem 
and wanting to address it and looking around and, and not seeing anyone else who was addressing these issues, which are the issues that I think are most important for working families in my district and across America, and certainly to me. Uh, and uh, it certainly takes courage to step up. I've never run for political office before, and you go straight to Congress. And you know, I know some people will say, well, why don't you start at the state level or the local level? City council, right? John. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I'm not, a, but that's not a good thing. I don't think, you know, the fact that so many people are in politics for life is really a detriment to uh, the shared experiences that we really need to bring to Congress. Um, you know, being a, a union lawyer for over a decade representing flight attendants, I know what it's like when people lose their job um, or uh, the issues that go into collective bargaining or um, the deficiencies that we have in our healthcare system. Um, and so wanting to address those issues first and foremost to make sure that we take care of people is is why I'm doing this. And, and really, you know, of course, I was nervous jumping into this race, not having run before. Um, but I knew that this was going to come down to talking to people. And I really enjoy talking to people and hearing about the issues that are most important to them. To them. And uh, I'm really proud that, you know, we have a crowded field. We have 22 people in this primary and the latest polling has this tied for third. Um, so um, that we're, we're on a really good trajectory here. We have three weeks just about to go. Um, so it's a really exciting campaign, a really exciting time. And you're endorsed by Bernie Sanders, right? Yeah, Bernie Sanders, uh, nine labor unions and counting. Uh, the uh, There's a youth climate action group um, that just endorsed us. And then we have the seal of approval from Moms Demand Action. Bernie's so popular. I mean, that's big. I mean, to have that endorsement. I mean, he transcends the traditional political divide, right? Absolutely. I mean, Bernie has transformed um, the political sphere, I think. And um, he is somebody who... He spent his whole career doing the right thing when everybody around him was not. Um, I shouldn't say everybody, but many people around him were not. And the fact that he has stuck to his guns throughout all these years and has given his whole life to try to improve the lives of, of working people and families is something that I'm going to tell my kid about, I think, for the rest of, of our lives. Um, and I'm, I'm so proud to have his endorsement. Yeah. Just on a 30,000 foot level, before we get into the policies, I think he would have beat Trump in 2016. That's my feeling. And of course, I think it's a shame that uh, he was basically robbed of the nomination. Yeah. I did vote for Hillary. But yeah, why do you think the DNC, I don't want to get you in trouble or ask you something, <laughs> but what happened there, man? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, uh, I, I think he absolutely would have defeated Trump. Um, and it's it's unfortunate that um, we we did have this process that didn't seem fair, I think, at least to those of us on the outside looking in. Uh, I had friends who were also very strong supporters for, for Bernie and were very disillusioned by what happened. And I think that the general election really saw um, the repercussions from that. Um, like like you, I voted for Hillary in the general as well. Um, you know, I was certainly not going to vote for Trump. Um, and I think that uh, the fact that when we look at the polling and we look at the issues that Bernie was really running on, uh, I think that that would have really done a lot of good for people. And I think it would have really drawn people to the polls too. Yeah, this focus that you have, that he has on working people, and economics, right? Right. Just economic justice from your point of view. And that is a whole thing to talk about economic issues versus cultural issues. So I think it's fair to say that Bernie is more focused on economic issues. I think and, he, oh, sorry, you, go ahead. No, no, tell me. What you I think. mean, I, I think he's, he's, uh, he's, he has very strong stances on, on all of that. I mean, when it comes to, um, you know, issues when, when you say cultural issues, I think things like LGBTQIA, um, mm -hmm. and making sure that we're advocating for our, our friends. Um, I think he's had a really good record with those things too. But of course, the number one thing that you hear about, I think in the media, at least is his commitment to economic justice for everybody. Yeah. Cause he's so clear and good at the messaging. He's amazing at it. Yeah. And, and yeah. we need more of that. So 
What's the deal with politics in America? It's dominated by big corporations, and that's what's in the way of democratic policies. Well, I don't mean Democratic Party. I mean the policies that the majority of people uh, support. In effect, we are an oligarchy for that reason. If we're at the mercy of big corporate interests. But then what you hear from the libertarians is the government should be totally gone, get out of the picture. So I guess what you hear online in the circles that I'm traveling in is Democrat corporate and Republican corporate, they're the same party, uniparty, that's corporate interest. Independence may be something different. Libertarians will say the government needs to be torn down because that breeds itself inefficiencies. So I, I take it you don't share that view. So you seem to be running on a platform of let's put the people first and to be, you know, to heck with what corporate interests say. And I like how you say, for example, you propose a constitutional amendment. Well, you're a lawyer, so that's obvious. You know. <laughs> but you don't just say, by any means necessary, we're going to fight Citizens United. You know, you're reasonable. You're talking practically. So I guess my question is, um, I don't know what my question is. Do you have anything to say to all that? Yeah, I mean, you raise a, a lot of good points. I, I mean, the, the money in politics... Is? is i i mean i think so uh there are a lot of things i could speak to at least and i think they're good um but i mean uh, when with what you're saying i think about first and foremost money in politics and you know i'm somebody who um is uh the, the subject of uh a political um super PAC that has jumped in this race and they are supporting one of the other people in this um who i'm running against um and they're they're doing it because of my positions um, and when they've already spent $1.5 million, uh, I'm a union lawyer, you know, I don't know all these wealthy people. Um, I know working people and we have a really strong grassroots, uh, level of support with union members and, and just people who care about economic justice, because the issues that unions fight for people care about across the board, whether or not you belong to a union. Um, and so seeing that I am very worried about our continued decline um, in democracy where you have these outside groups, this group, by the way, is, is APAC. They're funded nine out of 10 of their top donors are MAGA supporters. So they're the same people that are taking away, seeking to take away people's right to choice, um, and, uh, bolster the NRA and, um, undermine, uh, LGBTQIA rights. And so I'd rather not win than take their support. Uh, and I, I wish everybody in this race felt the same way. Yeah. Before we even get into the issues that are enhanced by this disproportionate messaging resulting from money influence, I guess the question is, is there any reason why we should allow or permit or be comfortable with a system where wealth gives you the ability to influence elections like this? You know, the idea that, hey, man, money is speech. And uh -huh. if you got a lot of it, you can use, you can speak louder. Is there anything to that? I guess it doesn't override the, the need for an election environment where that is absent. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really, uh, I mean, you use the word oligarchy and it's really, I mean, if we're not there, we're on the way there. Um, and so you see this conglomeration of wealth with the top 1%. Um, and since 2017, with the Trump tax cuts, uh, the one, top 1% has doubled their wealth. Um, I don't know about you, but I have not doubled my wealth since yeah, 2017. I won't say. Yeah. <laughs> uh, very far from it. Um, and um, I have a three-year-old. Um, and um, I, you know, when, when you see that kind of conglomeration of wealth where the top 1% gets so much more wealth than the rest of us, uh, that's not good for America. And the problem is, to your point, then that what does that 1% do with the money? And that's where they're influencing elections, where mm. they're using the money to deteriorate aspects of society. Um, and that's something that we really have to address. But you raised this earlier, you know, Citizens United, how do you do that? Um, and the the problem is we have some difficult decisions ahead of us, I think, to be able to combat big money. And I don't think corporations are people. Mm -hmm. Right. Difficult decisions that require 
difficult action. Right. Constitutional amendment or pass right. the court. That those are your only choices. Yeah. Mm. Right. And it's not just Citizens United. I'm talking about uh, Shelby County versus Holder um, with voting rights. Um, uh, you know, if we pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, um, who's to say that the Supreme Court is not going to step in and just strike that down too? And I have some brilliant young people in this district who I've been meeting with, um, meeting with their their local groups, and they actually raised that to me recently, and I was really impressed. Um, and so. I think we really have to think about what kind of country we want to have. Um, I'm a progressive. And so I really believe that government has a very significant role in helping people. Mm -hmm. Is government perfect? By no means. But I think we've had, we've gone down this really dangerous path since Reagan at the very least, where he talked about government being the problem. Um, to me, government sets these minimum standards, whether it's with economic regulations or education or workers, uh, health and safety, and states should be building off of that, not a race to the bottom. Um, and mm -hmm. so those are issues that we really need to address. So well said, and so beautifully captures the search for political identity. What is the role? Like I started off in a wacky way talking about UAPs, what is true, but what is the proper role of government? What is the relationship between citizen and government? And I like this focus on working people. I, I'm a construction manager. I've been working with working people my, all my life. They're the best people in the world. Yeah. I learn from them every day on so many levels. And so it's really pop, it's popular. It's really appealing, this idea of building your political identity around the working man. And it's interesting how Trump appeals to the working man. Maybe right. in, a, in a bit you can touch on that for me. But this idea of building your identity around political identity around the working man makes sense because one, they deserve it and they need it and they deserve it. And two, because everyone, even the Republican conservatives would say, yeah, work is good. We want to encourage work. We want to encourage productivity. The idea being that that will lessen your dependence on government. So everyone loves work. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, but why did Trump appeal? Does Trump appeal to so many working people? Yeah, I mean, he did and certainly still does. Um, you know, I go back to, uh, I just uh, listened to this brilliant book and I'm in between campaign stops. I'm listening to right. a book on, um, on, uh, in my car and um, it's called The Rebels. And it's talking about Bernie and Elizabeth Warren and AOC and, um, and really the, the development of the, of the Democratic Party over the last 40 years um, and how it lost its working class roots. Um, President mm -hmm. Obama is somebody who, I um, have always admired. I worked on both of his campaigns, um, you know, but in, when he was first elected, more people from Wall Street gave to his campaign than John McCain. Um, mm. So that's very telling, I think. Mm. Um, and, and starting at the end of the 1970s under Carter, the book talks about you saw this transformation within the Democratic Party where they really abandoned their working class roots um, and gravitated to Wall Street and hedge funds. Mm. Um, and that's, uh, that's not good. You know, that's why Trump appealing to people who are hurting um, across the country um, and, you know, people who uh, have have been out of work, um, who are um, are struggling to afford child care um, and who are worried about, uh, I think, about seniors who are worried about the future um, with on a fixed income when their Social Security benefits are going to less because of inflation. Um, so we really need to be appealing to their issues. Um, you know, you saw someone like Tim Ryan who was really doing that when throughout mm -hmm. his political career. I don't agree with Tim Ryan on maybe everything, but I think his emphasis on working people was really amazing. Um, and just for fun, does anything come to mind that you might not agree with him on? Well, I mean, I, he's a moderate, you know, and, and, um, you know, I think that, uh, in general, um, his focus on economic issues, um, was great. Um, but I think that he could have been a little more progressive um, with some of the, the cultural issues out there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, again, somebody who I think he was talking about a lot of the right issues. But I, I think that for me, at least, um, you know, we're talking about political identity. My political identity is definitely further to the left of him. Yeah. And so this idea that traditional family structures, traditional family structures, 
I mean, I don't mean to use the word in quotes, relative to America's history, traditional American fam family structures are under attack. And I speaking of identity, I mean, this is really such a, I mentioned I started the podcast while studying critical race theory, which is, I think, fair to say, a strong manifestation of um, identity politics, not to be pejorative with it, but this idea that identity does matter. Your personal yeah. identity is really relevant. It's, so this, and then the idea that libertarians would say, no, everyone's equal, everyone's the same. Therefore, we shouldn't care about particular identities because the individual is the ultimate identity. And it's all about whether the individual has what he or she or it needs whatever you know what i'm saying needs to thrive and that usually requires a family a traditional family structure and so they think they being libertarians and conservatives think that that is under attack and so that is the culture war i think um and i think the the reasonable progressive response would be look literally look the world around you see the people in it you see these people exist what do what are you going to deny their existence so except i mean you have to accept you have to accept that and you know that's going to lead to social barriers growing and changing as i guess they always do and that's progress and the other side will say but something unnatural something is going on something inorganic so that's the culture war, I guess. Yeah. What What do you mean by like the traditional family structure? I think libertarians and conservatives would say that at least based on all the content they see on libs of TikTok, you know, the pride flags in the young kids' rooms, the books about transgenderism in grade school, the fact that there are minors getting gender reassignment surgery that they just say hey man w combined with messaging from the state they would argue it just seems like this is not normal in their minds and they're really having a hard time accepting it and they think it's actually coming from a place of bad intent from either the state well, the state to distract from economic issues. I mean, this is what they say, but they don't like the culture war stuff and they and they think it's a distraction from economic issues. Yeah, I mean, I think people are always afraid of what they what's new and what they don't know. <clears throat> They're always afraid of that. And, you know, this is something that I think has been coming up more in the public arena recently, at least. Um, and, you know, when it comes to things like gender identity and everything, I, you know, I look to organizations like the the American Medical Association. You know, I look to to doctors and mm -hmm. professionals and what they think about it. And you know, I think that they're they're very clear with a science backed background um, that gender identity really is is a thing out there. Um, you know, I right. I met um, a, a voter in my district who uh, came who specifically moved to Maryland because she has a trans child and they lived in Florida. Um, I. And I, I've actually met a couple now that I think about that um, who are fleeing what's going on down there. And you see um, from a medical perspective uh, some real issues, I think, when we don't meet people where they are. And, you know, I, I very firmly believe that um, that this is their gender identity. And I think we should be encouraging that and nurturing them. And um, you know, I'm a strong ally of the LGBTQIA community. If you couldn't tell, I think I've talked about three times already because it's something I really care about because um, it's about justice for people and being very inclusive to everybody. And I know there's this, a lot of people talk about, uh, about this where they say you're distracting from the economic issues. And if we're going to win back um, certain voters, then we should focus on those and, and not focus on, on these other issues. And I think that people... I think we need to trust the American people that they can handle all of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the American people are, are very good people at their core. Uh, and, you know, like I said, I think that people are afraid. And I think also this goes back to where people get their news from, too. And so you see the Fox News organizations of the world really demonizing um, these groups um, and, 
you know, ultra right Republicans uh, using like bathroom bills and those kinds of things to, to demonize them. I, I just don't agree with that at all. And I'm always going to stand up for anybody who's in need of help. Um, that's why I'm a union lawyer. And, and so I think that we can address all these issues together. And I think America would be better for it. Well said. This idea, though, that can you be overly inclusive and then ultimately with gender neutral bathrooms, they'll say, man, we no longer have a women's and a men's room. My, I don't recognize the society. But can we be can you be so inclusive that you lose? Vivek touched upon this in his flirtation with the presidency, the nomination. He oh. said, um, we've become so focused on what unites us or divides us that we've forgotten what unites us. So is there a concern there that the progressives on the cultural war issues aren't speaking to, I just think from a effect, efficacy standpoint, perhaps progressives could, could speak a little more to the concerns that um, people who are not familiar with LGBTQ issues. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's, the responsibility of people in office to talk about these issues. And so with the the bathroom, the gender neutral bathroom, I think about a sign that I've seen before in coffee shops where it says, um, you know, it doesn't matter what your, your gender is, your gender identity is, just wash your hands. And I think that's what this really comes down to. And I think we need to just treat everybody with kindness along the way. And I think one thing that maybe sometimes the uh, progressives um, could do a better job of is, is being kind about these things and really talking to people. Mm, mm. Um, and well so, said, yeah, kind to some, which is to say to not assume that someone who is not comfortable with these issues is not coming from a negative place or an angry or a hateful place. Yeah. I think we just, we need to meet people where they are and work with them. Um, and to me, that means when you're being kind to them, that you're not, you're not demonizing them. Um, you you are telling them, you know, things like I was talking about with the American Medical Association. You know, this is a this is a legitimate health issue, um, and you know, I, I think about things like transgender youth have some of the worst depression um, in the United States, um, and making sure that we are we're helping everybody and we're explaining these things to people. I think we could do a lot better job of explaining it, and. You know, but it, I'll tell you, it's hard sometimes because you do see, and by no means is this everybody, but you do see people who are filled with hate talking about these issues. Yeah. And to those people, I could see it would be really hard, I think, to um, to address that with them because they're talking about our our siblings, our neighbors, um, mm -hmm. and you know that's mm. that's a very personal thing. Um, yeah. And I I just I care about people, and I. I want to be kind to everybody and that's always what I'm going to do. But I, I think, you know, I think that you're, you're right that, you know, we, we could do a better job of addressing this and fighting back against the demonizing of one of our most vulnerable populations. That's fair. We should all be making efforts to just keeping it more human and realizing that we're not just behind our keyboards all the time. We're talking about real people and, and we shouldn't be demonizing. And speaking of that, as people who have voted for Democrats, I guess we have Obama in common and Hillary mm -hmm. and presumably Joe Biden. Would you do we agree that Donald Trump has been demonized and his supporters have been demonized or do we not? Well, I mean, I think Donald Trump rightfully has been demonized um, for, mm. for who he is and what he's done. Now, his supporters, I think I think that's been a mistake, you know, when you um, and I think there's some elitism to that, too. Um you know, I think uh, speaking to to people who voted for Trump, uh, you know, I remember in 2016, uh, you know, that was a really tough time. And uh, talking to um, to people where we say, you know, we'll say, I don't even want to talk to you. You voted for Trump. You know, I, I don't think that that's good for America. Mm -hmm. And we should be talking to everybody and not demonizing them because I'm just, you know, to some extent, I'm just happy people voted because um, not enough people vote. Mm. Um, but at the same time, obviously I'm very troubled by people who are, were voting for Trump and, and I want to know why. Um, and, and I don't think that we've done a deep enough dive into that. Um, mm. 
And even though you've there, there have been studies out there about what people really cared about, but it's just not enough. Was Trump a bad president? Was he a rate him compared to Obama and historically, as far as you care to comment, if you don't mind? Yeah, do it now. Yeah. Do it now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the the modern Republican Party is not your grandfather's Republican Party. I don't think Ronald Reagan would recognize many aspects of it. Um, I think Donald Trump certainly was the worst president we've we've ever had. Um, hmm. And I, you know, I look hmm. at his inaction, his callousness to people, um, how he demonized people with disabilities, um, how um, he uh, discriminated against uh, people. Um, of the Muslim faith. Um, mm. I, you know, I, mm. I, I can't think of uh, a single thing that I liked that he did. Um, maybe I'll have to think about that. Maybe I can come back to that, but right. I'm, I'm struggling to. Um, and so, you know, seeing the damage that he did um, along with Mitch McConnell um, is, uh, you know, it, it's just something that I think we're still reeling from. You know, the January 6th and everything that happened there. I mean, he encouraged those people to go. I think it's very clear from what we're seeing from the court proceedings that are moving forward. Um, so uh, I, I just I don't like that guy. And I'm going to do yeah. everything I can to make sure that that Joe Biden beats him. You know, I remember on the site that I work on being a construction guy, as I mentioned, um, when Trump got elected, there was concern from my office saying, hey, you know, let's be mindful. There's a lot of Mexican people who work on site. Yeah. You know, they thought there were going to be fights and brawls and you know, no, there's something like that. But it was a crazy time. I don't know. From my perspective, I guess that's the thing. I've been so in my own world selfish that's part of the reason i'm doing this is because i've been living so selfishly and inwardly focused for so long that's just the reality and that's why i'm kind of underdeveloped on basically all of these issues uh and it didn't affect me right it was one of those things where it's like hey man like i you know the economy felt pretty good felt safe and his character flaws i was able to say you know i will judge him by his presidency as a president and as a man, if I feel like it. And, uh, but I hear you on all those issues. So Trump, I mean, uh, Biden, Kennedy, we're supporting Biden. Absolutely. Um, I, I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean, look at the Kennedy family. They, they all endorsed yeah. Biden just now. Um, yeah, I, saw that. I mean, I, I think the conspiracy theorists in RFK is, is troubling. I, um, I, I believe in vaccines, for example. Um, and so um, I'm very thankful for everything Dr. Fauci did um, with keeping our family safe. You know, it's just so interesting, John. Talking to you now and then talking to the people online that I've connected with on X, it's different worlds. And yeah. I, I'd be willing to bet that you're living in reality. And they're not. No disrespect to those people, because I'm in that community, guys. I'm your neighbor in there. We're not <laughs> living in reality. But I just want to make sure you are aware that there are plenty of people with decent working brains that are living there and think that there's a whole lot of crazy stuff going on with UAPs, whatever that might mean, and technology, suppressed technology and every conspiracy under the sun. Yeah. And so that's something you got to be aware of, my friend. Yeah, absolutely. I um, you know, it, it's um, I always uh, you know, I'm, I'm a lawyer like you. And so, you know, I always look to where are the facts here. And um, mm. as soon as I see facts uh, talking about these things, then right. I will, um, you know, wholeheartedly review that. Um, but I just don't you know, I think clearly we don't see a lot of evidence supporting a lot of, you know, I know we're kind of being a little vague about it, but about some of these conspiracy theories that like RFK is putting forth. Yeah. Yeah. Just conspiracy theories in general, tying into this whole point of I have, I have been struggling to sort things out. And so I'm a victim of misinformation, I think a little bit, but it's a crazy time. Um, anything on your mind uh, that you want to talk about in particular, you know, your policy is in the best way standard progressive i mean you're fighting you're pro you're going to go all in as hard as you can all the way it seems like for people to be able to live lives that are comfortable and affordable 
Yeah, I mean, I think everybody has the right to achieve the American dream, whatever that means to them. And when you see this economy and how it has really uh, bifurcated, where the wealthy continue accumulating wealth and um, the rest of us are falling short of that, you know, like structurally even, you know, most of us um, who are able to even own a home, which is a struggle, um, but for those of us who are lucky enough for that, you know, that's where your wealth is tied, right? Uh, for the wealthy, that's not the case. Um, their wealth is tied in Wall Street transactions. So that's why I favor a very small uh, uh, tax on Wall Street transactions that are currently not taxed. Um, you know, you go buy a pack of bubble gum at the grocery store, you pay a tax on that. You should be paying a tax on Wall Street transactions too. Um, and then, you know, you see corporations that aren't paying any taxes. Um, you know, there are these lists that have been coming out saying, um, you know, Nike and Jeff Bezos and all, all these huge companies haven't paid any taxes. Um, and meanwhile, that's a huge part of our income. And, you know, I think that is, that's just not fair. Um, and we need to, as a progressive, I really think that we need to be fighting for uh, equality for this and equity. Um, and, and so that's why I jumped in this race, because I see to your point, you know, an economy that really is veering towards oligarchism and or oligarchy, and um, and that's that's not good for all of us. Um, everybody should be able to have a home, um, and your student debt shouldn't settle you for the rest of your life. I mean, when I got my student loans, um, I I couldn't get student loans from the government to cover my entire undergrad tuition, um, so I had to get private student loans on top of that, and that was eleven percent. Uh, for the interest rate. Um, that's like usury. Um, and I, I knew at the time what that meant and everything, but I really wanted to go to Villanova University. So mm. um, that's what I did. Um, and I have since privatized them um, again um, for a lower rate, but we shouldn't, you know, we should be encouraging people to go to school, not discouraging them. And that's where a lot of labor unions are really great because they have, especially the building trades, like, like in your industry, where they have these registered apprenticeships, which I think is fantastic, where people learn they're going to be safe workers then, they're going to be skilled workers. Um, and I think that's a, another really great avenue here too. Um, but to address the cost of education um, and then to make it so that when, you know, the reason why I'm not a libertarian and I'm a Democrat is because mm. I think bad things happen. Um, and right. so it's so easy to say, I think, um, keep everything out of it, you know, keep government out of everything. Um, when, uh, I think that's a very privileged statement to make, mm. because, you know, you, you see the reality. You're cutting to the core. I'm so glad you hit that. The bad things happen. This is a, this is a cruel place in yeah. so many ways, this world. Um, it's also a beautiful place yep. as I become healthier and come out of my angst ridden way too long lasting teenage depression that probably lasted into my late twenties. Um, <laughs> I see the beauty in the world and I'm like, yeah, it's what you make of it and tragedies happen and it can be cruel. And I've been so at this point, lucky to avoid, I'm so privileged. I'm so privileged. That too is part of it. So bad things happened. I know Ray Dalio, I think it was Ray Dalio. I think a couple of years ago I picked up his book principles and I think it was in there where he mentioned he, this idea of witnessing a gazelle being hunted literally in Africa is what turned him, is what cut off his progressive urge. And I'm, of course, paraphrasing, but the idea I think was when he saw that lion eat the gazelle, he realized it was nature and he realized it wasn't anyone's role to really prevent that. Mm -hmm. And so the progressive view is that the, no government, is, government, government should do this, man. And yeah. the, and the libertarians, of course, would say that is disincentivizing the family structure, the whole thing, tax, the whole thing, the whole welfare, all of it. They say is tied to whether it's ne a ill intent or not. It disincentivizes self reliance, and uh, it's all about bad things happen, and what should we do about it? Yeah. Um you know, I think that 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 thinking about not helping people, um, that it's it's just it can be callous, I think. And you look at, um, you know, uh, studies, you know, I, I always go to studies. You know, I, I look at studies about. Don't do that. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> 
Well, I, I don't sleep very well, so that's why I read it. Right. Um, mm-hmm. But providing um, like income, um, guaranteed income mm-hmm. to individuals, for example, um, I can tell you those, I bet those libertarians and conservatives are going to say, see, that's the problem. You're disincentivizing, um, helping people. And, uh, and now they're going to be uh, taking aid from the government forever. And the studies show that's, that's just not the case. Um, when mm. you have, there are these pilot programs that have been popping up across the country in progressive states where you see it actually changes mm. people's lives that's and, interesting. and they're not on it forever. Um, and so, you know, we see like welfare reform in the nineties and, um, and at the time, I think it was celebrated by so many people. And, um, I don't understand really why, because when we see the ramifications of it, it really has hurt so many families. Um, and so of course we want fair treatment and whatever that means is probably different to different people, depending on your philosophy here. Um, but for me, I think, you know, it's like the student loan relief, even though I wasn't eligible for it because I had these private student loans again, I wanted everybody else to get that. Um, and, um, you know, because I know the ramifications of that when you're paying a huge part of your income on student loans and you're paying rent, how can you ever save for a down payment for a house in my district? The average house is five hundred thousand dollars at a seven percent interest rate. That's a lot of money, um, and I don't think that there are many people who could really afford that. Certainly, not a lot of young people. Um, and so, I think we need to be we need to be helping people, and government has a really important role with that. I think the only possibility a person has of convincing a libertarian or a Republican that UBI is a good idea would be to it would have to be totally unable to infringe that person's privacy and it would need to be really emphasized that it, the studies show that it's temporary in nature and yeah. that it um, doesn't perpetuate reliance and inefficiency, but that's interesting. And I think, so I think there's room, I think there's plenty of room, um, among these different political identities to find some common ground. Now, obviously compromises w- would need to happen, but I find it interesting to think about ways in which a libertarian, a conservative, and a progressive might agree, okay, we're not going to agree with every step in this process, but on balance, we like the we like most of it. So it's, it's, things can be done. I mean, it's, just, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you. Oh, this is this is a great conversation because I, I totally agree with you. But here's the problem, uh, money and politics. So, you know, the legislature is in session for a very limited number of days every week, uh, limited months during the year. And Ted Kennedy wrote about this in his book, in his memoir, um, talking about how it really it used to be where uh, you would spend so much time with each other, Republicans, Democrats, independents, um, mm-hmm. where you got to know each other. You built these relationships. And that's what leads to compromise and, and working mm-hmm. things out. Um, now we have so much money in politics that you're back in your home district fundraising the whole time. Mm. Um, you know, I. It's very interesting. Yeah. And I just jumped in this race in January. The primary is in three weeks from Tuesday. Um, so it's a sprint. And I can tell you the amount of time that you have to spend fundraising is insane. I. Um, and so, you know, when you're in Congress, that doesn't stop. And. Mm-hmm. I think that we would, I know we would be a much better country if we got money out of politics here where we didn't allow corporations to buy seats or big pharmaceutical companies. Um, and we had public financing for elections um, where everybody who got the requisite number of signatures could run. Uh, if you can demonstrate that kind of support, you should be able to run and you shouldn't let the fact that you don't know rich friends stop you from that. So I think you're on. You're really onto something here because if we really genuinely had people from different political persuasions in the same room, talking things through, spending time with each other, um, meeting each other's families um, and talking through the issues and where you're coming from without outside influence. I think we would get everything done. Interesting. In the same way that being online so much chronically has deteriorated relations between people in the social fabric, maybe a little bit. Yeah. The influence of money in Congress has deter- has had the same effect. Absolutely. And I mean, you see that with the positions that people take and the studies that have been done um, about how they're tied to your donors. Um, and, you know, the fact that, mm. you know, you have a group like APAC, for example, where 
um, you know, people who APAC supports, um, you know, if you are not 100% with them, they'll come after you and they'll fund a primary challenger against you. And you see that up and down the country um, in where they're taking on progressives. Um, or, mm -hmm. I mean, there was even a, a Democrat in California who came out today or yesterday um, saying that, you know, Netanyahu really needs to go. He's been APAC backed. Um, right. And so you see, you see things like that. And if it was just up to the voters, it would be very different. And, and so that's why I don't take corporate PAC money, um, even though I had the ability to do it. Um, and I don't, I don't think that that is, that's not the kind of campaign I want to run because if you start taking it now, you can't say I'll take it now and then you get in Congress and then I'll fix it. You know, like we, we see where that's going. You have to run the kind of campaign that you believe in and that you want to change America with how you're running. Um, and so for me, that means doing the hard work with meeting voters wh where they are and not going door to door and saying, you know, I'm John Morris, I'm running for Congress and I want to hear what's important to you. And nine out of 10 people want to talk um, and are really appreciative with the fact that you've come to their door and you're hearing their difficulties that are going on in their lives and their, their worries and frustrations. That's how we restore our democracy. Um, but with Citizens United out there, it's just not really possible unless we make big progressive change. Mm. Yeah, I think the theme of this conversation is let's see what would happen if you sucked the money out of politics. And, you know, before, you know, forget about a progressive's point of view or this person's point of view. But if we can remove the, the money out of politics, in other words, that should be something everyone should agree on. Absolutely. But I can tell you that is absolutely not the case in, in my race. Yeah. Um, you know, we we have that already. We had a forum just the other night where, you know, we have probably at, I think we had 16 people at the forum and all but one of us are rejecting corporate PAC money. Um, you know, and so on one hand, I'm, I'm so thankful for that because I think that's amazing. And I'm going to have friends who I made friends out of this race, whether they're voters or other people running for the seat. And so people I really mm -hmm. respect. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, when you have, you know, anybody in this race who is is not doing things like that, that are, I, I really think the right thing to do in rejecting super PAC money in particular. Um, and, and it's not direct money. Let's be clear. I mean, it, it is, uh, you can't coordinate under the law, but you know, I think we all know that mm -hmm. there, you know, that uh, some super PAC is not going to spend $1.5 million without knowing where you stand on their issues. Right. So it's getting coordinated one way or another. I, I, uh, so to speak, yeah, so to speak, to so that, to speak. But, yeah. yeah, not, 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 not to be, not to be focused on the legal jargon, but yeah, we know what we're saying. It's no bueno, <laughs> no bueno, no exactly. Bueno. Before we land this plane, John, and again, thank you so much for being here. This is, has been a great conversation. I really appreciate it. Um, let's talk about for let's direct our attention foreign to the foreign lands for a few minutes. Great. And I guess I'll just ask you one at a time to comment on Israel, Ukraine, and I think Taiwan, because those are the bills being proposed in the House. So a casual observer like me, someone trying to understand what's going on in the world, might be asking, why does our government want to send money to those three places? So take it as you want to. Do you have any comments about those places? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the unifying theme about this is democracy and, and the defense of democracy. And so whether it's Taiwan or Ukraine, um, or the people of Israel. Mm -hmm. um, we, as a government, have always stood for democracy. And, uh, you know, I'm really proud of uh, the history of the United States with standing up for people who, who have been hurt and making sure that um, when there is need around the world, we are, one of, we are probably the first country that always steps in to help people, um, that frequently steps in to help people. I wish it was always. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, when I see, um, uh, you know, Ukraine, for example, the, the fact that we're even debating this is mm -hmm. insane to me. Uh, I mean, this is a democracy that has been already attacked and not to mention, you know, neighboring Georgia, uh, was also invaded by Russia too, um, years ago. And so if we don't, uh, I, and I know that they're not a NATO member, um, but they are our friend. Uh, and 
if we don't stand up and defend them now and supply them with the weapons that they need, then they're going to lose this war by the end of the year. So it's up to us to stand with our friends there. And let's be clear, Putin is a murderer and he is somebody who the world would be better off if he wasn't here. Mm. And, um, and you see, and it's so sad because, you know, I think of Alexei Navalny, for example, and what he stood for in the end. And um, I think that he was really courageous with what he did. Um, and I see what um, all the uh, horrible things that Putin has done over the years. And I'm really concerned that he has this influence over the Republican Party and mm. uh, and specifically this relationship with Trump and that, you know, we cannot tolerate that. Uh, I mean, Ronald Reagan never would have accepted that. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to Israel, uh, you know, I um, I am really concerned with with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and also his cabinet, which is mm -hmm. ultra far right, right um, by any measurement. Um, they uh, what they have done in Gaza is completely inexcusable. And I think Jose Andres's uh, op ed in The New York Times was brilliant. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not going to quote it directly accurately, but I mean, the gist of it essentially was you can't bomb your way out of this to get the um, uh, to, to get the people who are hostages and you can't starve a whole people to death um, to, to seek your aims here. And when you see such suffering on such a widespread scale, um, if we don't stop what's going on now, um, the studies are showing that we're talking about potentially a hundred thousand dead. Um, and, um, and Israel is not the only country where you're seeing this kind of thing, but it's unique because mm, I'm glad you said that it's a good point for, it's just a good thing to add in there, I think. Yeah, exactly. And, and, I think that the key point here is the people uh, in Gaza have nowhere to go. And so that's a key difference with other conflicts too. Um, they're trapped there. And so um, aid is not coming in as, as it should be. Um, and Israel is not doing, it's, it's not following its legal obligations under international law with making sure that, that they are uh, doing their utmost best to reduce civilian casualties. Um, and so to see, I'm going to use this word again, the callousness of Netanyahu mm -hmm. with the people where he's being told about um, the, you know, the tens of thousands of, of dead, uh, largely women and children in, in Palestine is just, it's just awful to see. Um, I wasn't a fan of them before, and I'm certainly not a fan of them now. And mm -hmm. we, need, we need to step in here and take big action. And so we shouldn't be providing offensive weapons to them. Um, I, I fully support defensive weapons to Israel um, mm -hmm. because Iran is a bad actor in this region and, and Israel is isolated. Um, and, you know, I think that we need to understand that, and I touched on this briefly, but Netanyahu is like Trump. And so just like Trump didn't represent people like me, um, the three million people who voted for Hillary over him, uh, Netanyahu is pulling below, I think, 15% with the Israeli people. And he's just clinging mm. to power right now. It's it's just awful. Mm. And so to see the comments by um, like Chuck Schumer, um, I, I really appreciated that. And I think that he is, his heart's in the right place. Um, mm. and, and we need to step in there and make sure that U.S. tax dollars are not being used to fund bombs to kill innocent people. Um, Hamas is a terrorist organization. We have to acknowledge that. But the plan that Israel is utilizing just isn't working. Um, and we need to protect innocent people. Uh, Taiwan, um, you know, China is, is uh, you know, they, they are coming into their own now. We see, you know, where, uh, like with the Philippines, where they're battling over these disputed islands, even though it's clearly within, um, uh, it's clearly not theirs, um, but they're, they're seizing these islands and everything. And I know, um, attacking uh, 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 the Navy of the Philippines. Um, and so with Taiwan, I mean, they're, they're a democracy. They have the, the right to operate um, autonomously. And um, in the, these war games that China is playing um, are, are also very troubling. And so we need to come to the defense of a democracy here mm. to make sure that what happened in Hong Kong doesn't happen there. 
So I guess you, you thank you for all of that. It was wonderful. And I guess you don't have this view that is common among, once again, the people that I see on X, which for some reason is libertarians and conservatives, have lost the progressive friends on Twitter. <laughs> and these people have a really cynical view of all of that. And it's just interesting to hear you've been so pragmatic, rational, reasonable, yes, progressive, but I'm finding you persuasive in everything you've said today. And uh, it's just interesting to try to filter out what people think is, um, what's the, what's the word I just used? Uh, cynical, what to be cynical about. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm an internal optimist and I believe in the goodness of people. And, and so when I see that as the, uh, as Americans, we have so much to offer the world and each other. And when you see uh, people in need around the world, uh, we have the responsibility. Um, my, my personal philosophy is we have the responsibility to help them. And mm. maybe that differentiates me with other people. Um, but mm. I, I really firmly believe that um, because we see that when the United States um, can step in and help, um, that we, we can do a lot of good. Not always. Um, but uh, I think from a the perspective of we are here to to help everybody and to make sure that conflict de-escalates like like Joe Biden's doing right now with the Iran Israel mm -hmm. um, escalation and he's stepping in there to to try to call I think he's doing a good seems like he's doing a good job. Yeah, I th I think so too. Um and so um and not to say that it wouldn't be better if the whole thing had never happened such right. as Ukraine as well and there's the whole argument that if Trump or someone else were in president were in power, it wouldn't have happened. So not to alleviate any potential responsibility, not, you know what I'm saying, but I think he's doing a good job in this moment. I think he's in a tough spot too. Um, you know, because he, he is, uh, you know, obviously he is trying to encourage Netanyahu to, uh, to deescalate, to offer more aid, um, to, uh, people in Gaza. Um, he hasn't gone far enough though. And so, yeah, uh, not yet. Yeah. So I know yeah. he's in a tough spot, but at the end of the day, you know, you got to do the right thing here. And, right. and that means we've, we've got to stop Israel from doing what they're doing. Mm. It's a tough spot. You know, I was, wasn't sure if I was going to mention this as we wrapped up, but since we, I brought it back to Israel again, uh, I'll just close by saying, you know, it was hard enough to figure out my political identity when it was just try trying to figure out is the public reacting too strongly to Trump? Like, I know he's like not a great guy, but is there something weird going on with the public's reaction to Trump? And what do I, what should I believe about the pandemic and critical race theory, which I studied? I wasn't just reacting to uh, Fox news. <laughs> um, and you know, the, the culture war stuff, but so it was hard enough, but then this idea that I'm Jewish, I'm a reformed Jew from New Jersey, and I've got family that are Zionists. Yeah. And what do, what is that? What, where does that lead? You know, how do I wrestle with that? My Jewish identity is it's just another layer. And uh, my God, now I have to be an economist. Now I have to be an Israeli political scholar. It's no, but it's, it's a lot, man, to process, but I appreciate people like yourself who have processed it. And of course, everyone is always going to learn and be receptive to new things and grow, but you have to have a certain amount of confidence in what you believe to run for office. And so that's why I wanted to reach out to people like you. And so this has been in a sense, a dream conversation for me really, because you so well, I think represent progressivism, um, and uh, I needed this, so can't thank you enough. This has been great. I really yeah. appreciate you talking. I, I think, you know, this was a really great conversation. It was. It was. Yep. I'll take all the credit for it. So thank yeah, you. You should. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, you were wonderful and a lot to chew on. I mean, that's, I know it's a good one when I'm like, Shoot, fuck, I got to reflect <laughs> on this. So <laughs> thanks so much for your time and uh, best of luck to you. I hope you win. Great. Thanks, Brian. I really yep. appreciate it. Yep. Take care, my friend. You too. Bye-bye.